Romans 6. I realize it may seem a little ironic and backwards. Last week we looked at freedom in Christ. And today we're looking at from slavery to slavery. But really, when we think about what the slavery is that we came out of, and what the slavery is that we are in now, there is freedom. As we're going to see in today's text, if you are a slave to sin, then you are free from the control of righteousness. But if, but if you are a slave to obedience, then you are free from the power of sin. Unbelievers give a lot of energy and attention to going after sin. Think of the creative ways that folks in this world abuse themselves sinfully. Think of the imagination, the energy. Watch TV commercials, sitcoms, movies. And you see all manner of ways in which men of this world chase after sin. So I want to ask you, do you use the same imagination, do you use the same energy to pursue God's kingdom? Do you and me use the same energy now that we did in our lives before Christ when we were pursuing sin and sinful pleasure, do we use that same energy now to pursue holiness? Because if we are free from the slavery of sin, then we are free to the slavery of Christ. Think about the Apostle Paul. What changed between his pre-conversion experience and his post-conversion experience? Was he not zealous when he was Saul of Tarsus? Was he not zealously going after the people of the way? Was he not zealously persecuting the church of God? But, on the road to Damascus, the Lord spoke to him. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who are you, Lord? And for the rest of his life, the same zeal that was used to persecute Christians was now used to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll see in today's text not under the law, righteousness, the natural man. We'll see that contrast between the two slaveries and death and life. Let's pick up the verse 14 where we left off last week. For we know that the law is spiritual. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Chapter 6, verse 15, and we'll read the 17th verse. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law? under grace. And Paul simply said, God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether it's sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Lord Jesus, we 
about for you. We thank you for that doctrine that was delivered to us. That Christ Jesus died. He was buried.
You are committed to a life of righteousness in Christ. Why? Because in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, when you and me confess and repent our sin, surrendering to Him as Lord, God the Father imputes, places in you Christ's righteousness. And because Christ's righteousness is placed in you, then it is your responsibility to display that righteousness in right living. The law is a restraining influence. Or to give you a picture, But a 
obedience results in righteousness. When we place ourselves under the umbrella of God's wall, we stay dry from the rain. And it's saying dry from the rain. We are living practically daily righteously demonstrating the righteousness that God placed in you through Jesus Christ. We see in these verses the law of Christ. The law of Christ was the standard from the beginning. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Galatians 6, 1 through 6. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ. Where if a man thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. So let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate with him that teaches in all good things. The law of Christ teaches us. The law of Christ is a standard for us. Turn back with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and following. We see in the early days the Jerusalem church that standard being set forth. Those early disciples it says of them and they continued steadfastly, what? Of the apostles' doctrine. The doctrine would be the standard, it would be the law of Christ. Fellowship and breaking bread and in prayers and fear of human mind and soul and any wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and in all things common. So their possessions and goods and pardon to all men as they had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, to eat their meat with gladness and singles, or praise God, and have faith with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. What is the standard? It's the, it's the form, it's the doctrine that was set forth from the beginning, the apostles' doctrine. It's the law of Christ that Paul urged upon the Galatian Christians in which they were taught in the Word. It is the essentials. There are many churches who have various doctrines. There are Primary doctrine, secondary doctrine, and I'm hoping I spelled this one correctly, tertiary doctrine. Some churches make things that are secondary or tertiary things that, that are primary for them. What are primary doctrines? We talked in Sunday school. At Jesus' baptism, what is one of the primary doctrines we see? The Godhead, the Trinity. All three members of the Godhead were present in Jesus' baptism. Those primary doctrines are the essentials of what we must have in order to be saved.
say, if you don't believe these things, then you're not saved. Churches who want to focus on secondary and tertiary stuff, like some Pentecostals said, unless you receive the second blessing, unless you get baptized in the Spirit, then you're not truly saved. They're making a secondary doctrine something that's primary, that's false teaching and heresy. Primary doctrine is the essentials. The death, the burial, the resurrection. If we eliminate the death of Jesus, we cast Christianity to the side. If we claim that the resurrection was not literal and bodily, then we cast Christianity to the side. Look what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We won't take time to turn there. But in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, Paul gives a case for the resurrection. A resounding case for the resurrection. And what does he say about the resurrection? If there be no resurrection, then we of, are of all men to be pitied. We may as well eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And Paul was able to point to those eyewitnesses who saw the resurrected Jesus. And he said there were even 500, many of whom were still alive as of the time of Paul's writings letter to the Corinthians. Who physically saw with their own hands. This was all their own eyes. I was jumping to my next statement. Remember when Jesus appeared to Thomas. Because Thomas said, unless I will to touch him, I will not believe. Five hundred people saw him with their own eyes. Peter says to Thomas, what? Place your hand right here. Place your hand here. Lord, I believe. What did Jesus say to Thomas? Because you believe. Because you believe. Because you saw me, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believed. What's the application there? How many in this room have seen the resurrected Jesus? No hands point up? Guess what? Do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? If you believe the resurrection of Jesus and you haven't seen it, you are more blessed than Thomas. Because you have taken the word of those eyewitnesses. The last of whom was Paul. Who was one born as of as do out of time. These essentials are teachings these are the norms of Jesus and his disciples, the apostles. In these essentials, we have the demands of discipleship. The demands of discipleship. In our day, there's a lot of churches that walk down the aisle, shake the preacher's hand, pray a prayer, got out this little commitment card. You haven't been baptized with a dunk yet. Nonetheless, now you're a bit. But what's the demand of those members? Show up every now and then. Put a few dollars on the plate. In today's churches, there's too much of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called cheap grace. Grace is free, but grace is not cheap. And in far too many churches, we 
we have members who are holding the chief grace and preachers who are preaching chief grace. And chief grace does nothing to affect our society. Chief grace does nothing to call the society to the Savior. Bonhoeffer advocated for awesome grace.
Psalm 116, verses 15 and 16. Oppression in the sight of the Lord is death, is the death of saints. O Lord, truly I am thy servant. I am thy servant, and the son of thy enemies. If thou dost loose my bonds. The psalmist said that he was the servant. Lord and loose his bonds. So what are these two distinct bondages? What is the bondage that that psalmist was describing? That psalmist was describing a bondage that is rigorous, that is relentless, and that leads to death. Sin leads to death. Always, always, always. Leads to death. But the other bondage is joyous, it's satisfying, and it leads to life and peace. Freedom from the bondage to sin is about life. Freedom from the bondage to sin is but life. Jesus promised. That if we come in the end, that He will give us life. And He will give us what? Abundantly. To the world, they see sin as an abundant life. But chasing after sin, each successive sin has to provide a higher high than the one before. You can never experience the abundant life in chasing after sin. You can only experience the abundant life in chasing after the Savior. Verse 19. I speak after the manner of men. Because of the infirmity of the flesh. For if you deal with your iniquity, so it's both cleanness and your iniquity, and your iniquity. Even so, now you will remember servants of righteousness and the holiness. When you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. He's speaking of the natural man, he's speaking of your former sinful. He's speaking to Christians in Rome who are weak in their faith. This applies to a lot of folks in our society who name the name of Christ but are weak in faith. It's what demands that Paul use strong language. Life before Christ is full of what? Life before Christ is filled with impurity and is filled with ever increasing wickedness. Before you got saved, 
Do you have any control of the righteousness of your life? No. You were free from that control. You did as you pleased. You chased after that which you wanted to chase after. You pursued that which you wanted to pursue. You didn't have the bondage of righteousness. But that freedom was the most undesirable freedom. Why is that? Why is it that the slave of sin has a form of freedom that is so undesirable. Let's think in terms of what that slave to sin and what a, a slave of obedience looks like. Verse 21. What fruit had ye then in your former life in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? When the end of those things is death. But now they made free from sin and become servants to God, yet their fruit and the holiness in the end everlasting life. Sin leaves you with memories that produce shame. Think about your think back on your life. This is not testimony time, so you don't have to verbally share, but think upon your life. Think about the memories that you have for over the years. Now there are some memories that are good memories. There are some memories that produce nostalgia. But there are other memories that you have that produce what? They produce shame. You're ashamed of that person that you were. That's what Paul says here. What fruit had ye then in your past in those days where ye are now in your present of shame? Sin will produce memories that will bring you down further and further and further into shame. And the only way for the unregenerate to cope with the shame is to give in to the set of pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance is the sinner's coping mechanism for his own shame. Obedience produces holiness <coughs> and sanctification. So whereas slavery to sin produces shame, Slavery to obedience produces holiness and sanctification in the need of another else. Turn with me to back to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, and we'll read 7 to 10 now. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth the spirit shall the spirit reap like the last. Let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we therefore opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially in them who are the household of faith. Don't grow weary of doing good. Do good to all men, especially they who are the household of faith. That's sanctification. But what are the good works? Is it simply as parents said one time in Sunday school, how many old ladies you helped cross the street? No. The good works they're doing good to Paul speaks of their relations. It's not works that you and me can try in our minds and our imaginations. They're the good works that God gives us in His Word. 
How are we sanctified? By reading His Word. Allowing His Word to wash our hearts, to renew our hearts daily. How are we sanctified? By spending time with Him in prayer. How are we sanctified? By coming together for corporate worship, fellowship with the saints. How are we sanctified? By being equipped for the work of ministry. Great many folks may attend good, sound, Bible-believing, Bible-teaching churches. And they receive sound instruction week in and week out. But they never carry their instruction from their pew into the the world. Far too many folks want to go to practice. They don't want to be in the game. Far too many folks go through basic training, but they don't want to go to war. Paul said what to the Ephesians. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with the principalities and powers. Why do you come to worship? To be equipped. Why are you equipped? So that you can wrestle. Why are you equipped? So that you can do ministry. Ministry isn't what's done within the four walls of the church. Ministry is what's done when you get your haircut. Ministry is what's done when you're turning that wrench. Ministry is what's done when you're driving that forklift. The slave of obedience is free from the control of sin. This is the last week. If you're a believer, you're going to be tempted. If you're a believer, you are going to occasionally fall into sin, but you're not going to wallow in that sin. You're not going to remain in that sin. But then if you're a slave of obedience, if you're free from the control of sin, you know what? You have real freedom. You don't have an undesirable freedom. You have real freedom. Eternal life is the secret. Eternal life is the sequel to genuine salvation. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 29. Jesus answered and said, Verily I say to you, there is no man that has left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel. But he shall receive an hundredfold. Now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. In this life, if you profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you surrender to His costly grace, then you are inside. The moment you close your eyes for the last time, that moment you begin eternal life. Eternal life is the sequel to discipleship. In verse 23, probably one of the most well known verses in all of our lives. Indeed, this is part of what's commonly referred to as the Roman road. Roman 
road is often used to lead folks to Jesus. Beginning with Romans 3.23, for all sin comes short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5, we're saying that when we confess our sin, He is faithful in hell. But God demonstrates, chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrates His own love for us, even while we're in sin, Christ died for us. Romans 6.23, our current passage, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Paul uses two words here to distinguish death and life. In our day, we don't ordinarily hear life and death. This is a life and death decision, both will tell us. These are life and death circumstances, folks tell us. But Paul speaks in terms of death and life. And he uses the image of wages and gifts. Wages is the Greek word opsania. That is a provision for living. Do you know what's interesting about sin? Sin is a terrible pay, pay master. Sin promises life, but it gives you death. Wages are paid regularly. And through those regular accruing of wages, death casts a long shadow over your life until that final payment.
If you do not serve God, then you serve sin. It's that simple. It's not door number one, door number two, door number three. There are two doors. And you either walk through door number one, or you walk through door number two. You are either serving God, or you are serving sin. There is no middle door. There is no door number three. You gain nothing by serving sin. You gain nothing by serving sin. You receive only shame and death. Thank you. 